Hello, I'm Mike Sandone, and today I'd like to talk about the restoration of my 1760 house. Back in 2004, at the height of the inflated real estate market, a developer bought this old house and subdivided the 10 acres of land into three building lots. He intended to build three much larger houses on the subdivided lots, but first he would have to demolish the old salt box. To get rid of the house, it would either have to be torn down using an excavator, or it would have to be burned down under the supervision of the fire department. Since there are no laws prohibiting the demolition of historic houses, the developer was able to get a demolition permit for the house. The town historian from Monroe saw that this house was going to be demolished and stepped in and put a 30-day hold on the demolition. It was at this time when I first saw the house, with a demolition sign hung from its north wall. I walked around the property and I was in awe of not only how good condition the house was in, but how well preserved the property was as a whole. All of the original barns, the outhouse, everything was still intact. These early houses were also built on the best plots of land. The house was built on a knoll facing the sun to the south, and it had a small hill to the west sheltering it from the wind. It also overlooked a small pond. A few days later, I bought the house. I invited an old-timer who was born in the house and spent his youth there in the 1920s to come talk about the house. I was born in that house wow. 80 years ago. 80 years ago? Yeah. Wow. Yep, I was born in there. Gee. That's why I, wouldn't, I didn't want them to tear it down. These are the regular beams. But they weren't showing at the time they had it all plastered. Yeah, but yeah. See, he took it all down and he showed the beam yeah, right, right, yeah. in there. It was all plastered. That's why that chimney looks different. It was all plastered. Hmm. It was all white. Huh. It was all plastered. Huh. This was the dining room. Oh. Never used it. Huh. They had their best furniture and everything in, in here. Never had no heat out here. Yeah, the only room they had here was the kitchen, and the bedroom here. This is where I used to sleep. Yeah? <laughs> this right here is where I used to sleep. This is the bedroom. Uh -huh. We used to spread out and put cranberries in here. We used to use this room to dry out the cranberries <laughs> wow. to make cranberry sauce and everything. Yeah. Here the same way, books and... All that stuff they used to keep in here. Oh, we'd like to see it back yeah. there. Like, like my brother and I, we used to love to get up here and go through the stuff because it was old. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's back it. then even. See Broken all furniture all and... Uh, all that, and then yeah. up into the attic. Yeah. They had the attic. I invited local historians to see the house. Well, that makes sense it was quarried on site. If it was quarried, then they're going to knock it out. Yeah. As, as, kind of, as kind of ashlar where it's flat. Let's see the basement. Oh yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, I, I think it's just a draft. Do you think it's an oven? Yeah, I do. Now let me explain the reason why. Uh, if it was just a draft hole, it would have been cool. But yeah, it's definitely definitely molten glass. Well, that could have been in there when they were, uh, for whatever reason, it had, it had gotten uh, placed in there when they were doing something. <laughs> she actually went in there. She, she emailed me about the fact. That yeah. That in there. I never envisioned anything like this. <laughs> But if you have to remember, th this type of house was built by somebody who was closer to the Middle Ages than they were to modern times. Yeah. And in the Middle Ages, you did not have closets. No what you did have were chests of drawers in which you kept all your blankets and all the rest of that sort of thing. Yeah. So you didn't waste space with closets. Mm -hmm. That's something that won't come along until the 19th century. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. part of Victorian architecture. See, see the hand planing marks? Oh, yeah. Aren't those neat? It's nice as this. We're in the process of putting this thing together. They, they build it on the ground and right. fit the mm. joints, joints together and number them because they know if they'd mix the might rafters, not, they might not fit. Yeah. Um, One of the oldest colors I could find was a light, like a really light green. Like, uh, oh. Kind of like, yeah, a, a weird light green like that. Everything has it on it. Huh. The, the lowest I could scrape down to is that green. Paint. But the only way to absolutely be able to, sh to be sure of this is to actually get out on the, and start taking paint samples off uh, and then try to see if you can get back to the, what the earliest color is. The house was in perfect structural condition. There were some cosmetic changes that I wanted to make, but that would have to wait until after the barn was restored. The barn would become a workshop, and unlike the house, the barn did have some major structural rot and, car and carpenter ant damage. The sills had mostly rotted away, so I jacked up the barn, I had a new slab poured underneath, 
added new sills and squared up all the posts so that the, the barn was now sitting level on a new slab. There was an addition built on the barn at some point in the 1900s and unlike the main section of the barn which is 8x8 chestnut posts, the addition was built with 2x4s and it detracted from the look of the barn. So this addition had to go. So I simply cut the ridge beam and hooked it up to my truck and with the slow pull and low range I was able to just topple over the addition and then basically cut it up and dispose of it. So now the barn was returned to its original facade. So with the new slab in and the addition gone, I began residing the old barn. So I stripped off all the old rotted siding and I added new shiplap siding to the barn. The round are all new and the slab is new also. That's all I want to do today. Where's the window? Oh, right there. Yep. See, I'll show you how it'll look. I'm actually, I was gonna, um, I was gonna set this down in more, but I decided not to. Well, it's not like this weekend. So I didn't just reside it. What I did was I resided the barn, I added insulation to the outside of the barn, and then I resided it again. So the inside of the barn has the correct look for a barn. It has the siding and the beams showing. It wasn't insulated on the inside where the beams and the siding would be covered. So this was a really good look for the inside of the barn to keep it looking original. I built new barn doors and insulated those as well. And I even used the original strap hinges, which were of a unique design using two pintles per hinge. And when I removed the hinges, I even found the name of the blacksmith who made the hinges stamped in it. I also added a few more windows than the barn had originally. Uh, I used some salvage sashes, some eight light sashes that would have been original for that time period. The window panes are six inches by eight inch, which are the correct size for the 1700s and early 1800s. The siding was let to age naturally. I didn't paint it or add any finish to it. So it, it mellowed to a nice gray finish, which combined with the vibrant red of the trim really gives it a nice original look. It's a look that would have been familiar to the original builders of the barn. Maybe the trim wasn't painted or maybe the whole barn was painted, but it's, it would have been a familiar look to the builders. Once the barn was complete and the workshop set up, I began working on the house. So the first thing I did was I added some original type windows. So these are eight over 12 windows. So there's eight lights on the upper sash and 12 lights on the lower sash. Again, the panes are six inches by eight inches, which was a standard size for the 1700s and early 1800s. So while I was doing this restoration on the house, the developer began to build the houses on the subdivided lots that were part of the original property of the house. So I saw these houses go up and I was really unimpressed with the construction. The houses were built with two by fours and two by sixes like all my other modern houses. My house was built with eight by eight oak posts and beams. So it's an oak framed house. The houses that were built by the developer were built purely just so the developer could make a very large profit when he sells the house. My house was built by the original builders so that it could be passed from generation to generation. It was meant to keep in the family. They didn't build it to make a quick profit. Also, the new houses had an awkward, kind of an awkward, unbalanced, unbalanced proportions. They were kind of um, a little bit odd in aesthetic. My house, on the other hand, adhered to the golden ratio which the original builders of the house knew well. The, the, these builders, this was the construction technique carried over from medieval Europe. And it shows in the construction of the house that they were very masterful in their, in their work. The new houses were also huge. They were over 4,000 square feet. My salt box is about 1,100 square feet, but every inch of the space is made use of. There's no wasted space. So after seeing these modern houses that would have replaced my house if it was demolished. I redoubled my effort to restore it. I wanted to make sure that I do a really nice restoration on this house so that it lasts another 250 years. So after I got the windows in, I started working on the interior and I wanted to return the interior back to its original appearance. At some point the house was uh, kind of gutted and re-sheetrocked uh, in, in a bland modern style and I wanted to put back all of the woodwork that the house would have had. 
So what I did was I looked at the posts throughout the house and determined that the house would have had wainscoting. I could see the shadow line on the posts where the wainscoting would have been. And it would have been just below the height of the windows. So being that the house is a small, simple farmhouse, I decided to go with a very simple type of wainscoting. Basically just two pine boards that were about 12 inches wide that were hand planed and joined with a feather edge joint. This would run horizontally below the windows around all of the rooms. I also added some walls where I had noticed that walls had been taken down and every single piece of trim I added was hand planed with a block plane. I didn't want to have any machined wood in the house. It wouldn't have looked uh, appropriate to the original doors that were still in the house which were hand planed and you could see the hand planing marks in the wood when you looked at it at, a, at an acute angle you could see the waves from the block plane so it was a necessity that all the wood that I added to the house was planed in the same way as it would have been originally. So I also started construction of a new kitchen. The old kitchen was in the corner of the large north room which was actually originally a bedroom that was closed off. But what I want to do was expand the kitchen and I wanted the kitchen to be facing directly with the original cooking fireplace. I wanted the kitchen cooking fireplace to feel like it was part of this new kitchen. So what I did was I took the small addition that was on the back of the house. It was a very old addition, but what I did was I simply opened up the wall that was the original wall to the house and opened that up into the new addition and continued the original oak floors into that addition. The wall that I took down, I actually used those chestnut boards uh, again in the house. I actually used the chestnut boards to make a dining room table out of. So I did re-salvage the boards that made up that wall. I didn't throw them away. They're now my dining room table. So I gained some extra square footage in the kitchen and I moved everything over so it would be facing the cooking fireplace. I added an island that was right on the corner of one of the posts. Now for the countertop material, I wanted to match the stone as close as possible to the stone on my hearth, on the hearth of the cooking fireplace. What I didn't want to do was add glossy granite countertops. There are no glossy finishes in this entire house. It wouldn't, it wouldn't look right. So I was able to find a stone that matched the approximate look of the hearth. A black, a dark grayish black granite with uh, specks of tan in it. Uh, it looked very close to the original hearth and the finish was a rough finish that was uh, simply oiled. It was left rough and oiled so it wasn't a polished finish on the countertop. So I thought this was really important because when you're standing in the kitchen at the countertop and you see the hearth of the fireplace in the background, the two finishes blend in. They're really, really close. Also for the kitchen, I used hand planed wood to make the island and to build the cabinets. I went with a very simple design uh, I used uh, a dental work crown molding on the kitchen that would have been much fancier than anything the house had originally, but I wanted to add a little bit more detail to the kitchen. So the entire kitchen was finished in a tan color paint, a color that would have been available in the 1700s that looks appropriate in a house like this. Uh, also, you would notice that in the house, all of the trim got painted the solid color and the walls were always white. The walls would have been plastered and left white, Whereas all the trim would have been, all the wood, where all the wood trim would have been either left natural wood or that would have been painted. But you'll rarely see in a 1700s house, especially a small farmhouse like this, where the plaster is painted a color. It's usually left white and the wood is painted a contrasting color. So the upstairs was also restored. Uh, the one exception was that the larger closets were added to the bedrooms and a bookcase was added upstairs. I'm really happy with my restoration of this old house. There's something about these old houses that just get the imagination going. Just looking at the beams and realizing that someone had to have felled that tree and then squared it off and shaped it into workable timbers that make up this frame. It's just amazing to think back to that time period, to think what was going on um, politically in the area in the 1760s. Uh, what was going on, how the farming was, was reshaping the landscape, um, how the indigenous people, the Indians were uh, meshing with the colonists that were building these houses in the area. It's a really fascinating period of time. And every time I look at any part of the house, I'm instantly taken back to that time. I, I try to imagine what the original builders look like. I try to imagine what the forest looked like that once stood where the house was that was felled 
to, to build the house, um, all the processes involved in building it, digging out the foundation hole, building the stone foundation, building the fireplaces, um, fitting the iron uh, crane to the fireplace. These were all, these, all these iron pieces were really expensive at the time. Um, just the way the original house was used early on when it was only one year old, what did it look like inside? What were the people like? that were living there, um, how was their, their state of living, how was their standard of living, um, what it was like 50 years after it was built, what was it like 100 years after it was built, how it was changed through the years, um, how it was lived in by, by pretty much the original family through the years and, and never really sold. Um, it's really fascinating how the house can get the imagination going, looking at a, a fire in the cooking fireplace and imagining being transported 250 years back in time when people were actually cooking in the beehive oven in the fireplace and huddling around the fire for warmth on a cold December day. It's, it's really an inspiring house in the fact that it was built with such high quality workmanship, so it's built to such a high standard. All the joinery, all the mortise and tenon joints, some of them you can't even slip a razor blade between. They're so tight, they're so masterfully built. The, the house was also built to, to pass down through the generations and I feel like I'm part of that history to preserve it and not let it be demolished and replaced with a cheaply built uh, modern house. Uh, so this was a really rewarding project. I'm just about finished with the house now. Uh, I'm happy to say that it came out better than I expected and I'm just thrilled to be part of the history of this house and preserve it for future generations.